So we've learned that your body is not just your human cells. That's pretty cool. But your human cells are still unquestionably a huge part of you, right? Sort of. Now I have another question for you. Within that minority of cells, those human cells that make up your body, how much of the DNA within the genome of those cells is human DNA? Okay, that's a trick question, because all of it could be called human DNA. But calling it human DNA also undervalues where that human DNA came from. Let's start with the mitochondria, that remarkable energy producer of the human cell. Mitochondria are an essential part of our cells. They are cellular organelles. They are found in nearly every eukaryotic cell, so it's not just part of humans. What's weird is that mitochondria resemble bacteria. They even have their own circular DNA, much like a bacteria. And it turns out, this is not a coincidence. If we were to crank back time to roughly two billion years ago, we would see that the common ancestor of us and all other eukaryotes lacked a mitochondria. We could watch what happened next. We would see where the mitochondria came from. It's now very obvious that mitochondria were once free living prokaryotes, bacteria-like organisms, that developed a symbiotic relationship with the precursor to the eukaryotic cell. Basically, one cell consumes another. But instead of digesting that cell, such as using it as food, a symbiotic relationship forms. We still see this process happening today. It's called endosymbiosis. For one example, let's talk about Polynella chromatophora. It's a single-celled amoeboid, a tiny blob-like creature, and a type of eukaryote that only recently began a symbiotic relationship with another cell that can perform photosynthesis. In other words, it's getting energy from the sun. As a result, Polynella chromatophora can now get energy by photosynthesis. To provide more detail on how this works, this amoeba's new photosynthetic capability is from a new cellular organelle that originated from a cyanobacterium, a completely different type of microorganism. The organelle is so young that it's nearly an intact cyanobacterium. Some of the cyanobacterium's DNA has transferred into the nuclear genome of the amoeboid. But most of the ancestral cyanobacterium's genome remains completely intact. You might ask, why are this cyanobacterium's genes getting transferred into the nuclear genome at all? This process of transfer can be sufficiently explained by probability and evolution from mutation. As you'll see, it's an important process to understand. Bacteria DNA have higher mutation rates than nuclear DNA. In essence, a bacteria cell is a less stable environment than the more complex, compartmentalized eukaryotic cell. When a gene from the bacteria gets duplicated by chance, it may end up by chance in the nuclear genome. These duplication events are quite common types of mutation. Also, having two copies of the same gene is often inconsequential. Epigenetic aspects of the cell can typically handle that. Because mutation continues to be high in the bacteria-like organelle, there's now a greater chance that the gene that remains in the bacteria will get a mutational damage or potentially get deleted. If that happens, there's no harm because a backup copy of that gene is in the nucleus. Overall, we see that endosymbiotes increasingly have their own DNA held within the nucleus of the eukaryotic cell, rather than remaining in their own structure. In humans and most eukaryotes, mitochondria have evolved to have more of their mitochondrial genes in the cell nucleus. That is, they are mitochondrial genes, but they're no longer in the mitochondria. Using evolutionary principles, we can find these important mitochondrial genes. Because mitochondria are major powerhouses for our cells, it's important to find these genes. These nuclear mitochondrial genes are involved in a wide range of important functions, and variation at these genes explain a wide range of metabolic diseases. Overall, the mitochondrial genome is less than a tenth of its original size. If we look at what remains of the mitochondrial genome, we find the free-living ancestor that they have today. It belongs to a group of bacteria known as Rickettsialis. Rickettsialis bacteria are very fascinating. In fact, many of these bacteria survive by endosymbiosis even today. And some members of this order of bacteria are also famous pathogens, causing diseases such as typhus and spotted fever. 
In other words, the major energy producer for our cells, the mitochondria, has quite a few black sheep in its close family. So the human cell, like nearly all eukaryotic cells, can be thought of as a composite built up from an intimate relationship with prokaryotes. This evolutionary relationship is important to understand. Consider butyrate metabolism. Butyrate is a very important food for cells that line the colon of your digestive tract. Without butyrate, these colon cells would eventually die. Butyrate is made by free-living bacteria in your gut when you digest fiber that you've eaten. In other words, butyrate is a byproduct of your gut microbiome. You need it to be healthy. And guess who's involved in taking that butyrate and turning it into energy that your cell can use? You've probably guessed it, the mitochondria. I hope you've started to see that your relationship with bacteria is extremely complicated and very deeply rooted evolutionarily. Parts of your cells and your genome are quite literally built up from these prokaryotic foundations, and your intimate relationship with them remains until this very day. Recently, we have fundamentally changed our relationship with many of these bacteria. Chlorinated water, highly sanitized food, antibiotics are a major deviation from the deep evolutionary relationships that we've had. Also, they appear to have a serious consequence. One of these consequences has been phrased as the hygiene hypothesis, which in brief argues that inflammatory diseases such as allergies and eczema and an extremely long list of other diseases may have been exacerbated in recent times because how we've changed our relationship with microbes. It's a hypothesis that connects many diseases of civilization, or more precisely, diseases of industrialization. Basically, our immune systems are becoming poorly trained, leading them to overreact, even to otherwise harmless stimulation, like pollen. For certain autoimmune diseases, this hypothesis appears to be quite true, and there is still much research to be done to find out where else it might apply. This is not to downplay the remarkable contribution antibiotics have made to our health, and you should certainly listen to your physician's recommendations if they prescribe you antibiotics. I'm quite happy we have these wonderful medical interventions. Western medicine, or more accurately, evidence-based medicine, will improve as we gain a better understanding of our connections to microbes. But even in its current form, evidence-based medicine has by far the most reliable track record at saving lives and improving the quality of life than any other option we have available to us at this time.